Okay, I'm quieter, so I'll take the louder mic. Uh, first, hey, uh, like they said, we are Nick and Aaron Potter. We both grew up about 15 minutes north of Salt Lake City. Um, we did not date in high school, he says. <laughs> we did go to a Modest Mouse concert once, and he said he only took me because his other friend couldn't go. Uh, but. We can't get into this argument like right here. I didn't know you were going to talk about this. But I count, I count that. Anyway, uh, we ran into each other again a couple years after high school at a Sue and Stevens concert and started hanging out. Um, and I was uh, in my undergrad doing uh, art, and he was doing English. And when we would hang out, we'd be doing our homework, and um, I love English and would want to correct his papers for him. And he would get like so bored with his stuff that we would just start swapping and doing each other's work, which was really dishonest. But um, we kind of started collaborating then. And our first um, stuff that we sold together as collaborators was in 2005. So we've been collaborating for 15 years now. Um, uh, also, like, who are all of you? <laughs> We're going to go one by one and just pass the mic around. So get prepared. We have lived here for seven, seven going years. on eight years. Sometimes I feel like it's so small that I know everyone, but I literally know no one in this crowd. So I'm, Yeah, so you're not here for us. You're all very <laughs> this is good. shiny and, and look professional and young, and you're very intimidating. <laughs> Easy to slide. So yeah, this, we also have um, two boys. One of them's here. Um, they are our most destructive collaboration. <laughs> Yeah, but we are uh, fairly destructive. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Um, collaborators in general, I would maybe uh, just introduce you. I don't know if all of you have an angle on this um, projection, but uh, we're going to be using it quite a bit. Um, we're just going to go through a few slides here. This is my stuff. I'm a cartoonist and a writer um, and a self-taught uh, artist and painter. Um, uh, I've always doodled, and Aaron's right when I went into an English degree, um, and we'll stop right there, uh, in... Um, in undergraduate, I, I was always doodling and stuff like that, and I didn't think of myself as a visual artist, uh, or, or I'd kind of put it on the back burner until we met, and she was making art, and she looked at my sketchbooks, and she's like, you should make art with me, and then I started creating again, and so like it was a really big push uh, for me to kind of uh, be serious about like the doodles that I'm making, or something that could be... Uh, something that other people would be interested in, that it was worthwhile, that no matter the level of the work that I was creating, that it meant something. Uh, it meant something to her, uh, and it could mean something to other people, and it's not something that I should just stop doing. Um, so I started doing that, uh, uh, working with her. Uh, I, I also uh, started delving into abstraction uh, and chaos and, and comics, of which this is an example. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. So that's just an introduction into some of my work, uh, and then Erin has some work uh, that she show you. Also, Nick is a professor at MU. Oh, yeah. That is why we live in Columbia. Yep. Um, he did his. Good. <laughs> he, he got his PhD here, so that's why we've been here. So, um, I tend to be more interested in realism and portraiture, and so it, it's uh, always fun to draw with Nick because we have very different styles. I use a lot of different types of media. Um, my degree was just called two-dimensional art, so like anything flat. Although, <laughs> but um, that's not that, that. I mean, that's not everything. You can go one slide forward. I also do some three D work. I just like to do a little bit of everything. I think I get bored being in one media for very long. How many of you are in a creative field? Like everybody. OK. All right. And it's a good way to think about regardless of what you're in. Uh, I, I thought the, the introduction to Creative Mornings was really great in considering and, and understanding your life through a creative lens, regardless of uh, whether or not you've previously seen yourself as a creative individual. 
um, there's always creative work to, that goes into everything we do. Um, so when uh, we look at our, our two works separately, um, we were asked to talk about invest um, and the uh, initial connotations that come with that are financial and that has never been a large focus of the, the art that we produce, although it's definitely an important thing to, to think about or consider, but it's not something that we should be talking about. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but they, they, they said that collaboration, our collaborative uh, mind was of interest to them and, and definitely the things that we're going to be talking about with regards to investment or investing is the kind of investment that we do into each other's work um, in terms of collaboration. Um, so that's time and energy and also an important component of our uh, career, if you want to call it that, as artists has been investment in the community, which uh, is a part of what this is all about. So this fits very squarely into our wheelhouse. So if we go to the next slide here, um, sometimes we draw together, like we try to draw a picture. Um, and you'll see on the left is Aaron's picture in like five minutes and mine on the right is uh, different than hers. <laughs> and so talking about the, the, the differences in the way that we approach uh, our, our skill set um, um, in approaching creativity, putting that together has been uh, has created something kind of interesting. We're going to show you a lot of that work. Here's a couple of examples um, uh, following this. Um, this is kind of a pixelated example, but it turns into kind of a collagist, um, um, no hold barred um, experience. And just like a relationship requires a lot of vulnerability, it's scary to meet somebody and to uh, bring them into your lives, um, the same is true of an artistic practice, right? There's so much vulnerability that goes into like letting somebody like, like your art, one. Like how huge is that? Letting somebody else love what you do or like what you do. That's very hard for me and I think for Aaron as well. Um, and so it's an important step to try to be vulnerable in that stage. Um, and um, something that we've really grown to enjoy is that we get to share the weight of the vulnerability of sharing our work um, when you go into that creative practice, right? To be able to uh, say like, okay, we, we're doing this together, we're both going to bear the weight of the backlash that comes from this painting that's going to change the world. That's always what it feels like, right? So uh, everyone's going to hate it. Um, so we, these are some uh, low-grade um, images as well. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But this is just a quick snapshot into some of the work that we've uh, produced together um, and what it means to build and, and mix stuff in a creative practice. This is, this is a video yeah. clip, and yeah. I'll just kind of introduce it first. Uh, we did a project in 2007 called the 337 Project, which was in Salt Lake. A lawyer had like a pretty big property downtown and was going to have to demolish it. And he had recently been to New York City and seen the Wooster Collective building. Does anybody know what I'm talking about there? So it was a building which they just uh, doing the same thing, about to knock it down, but uh, made a site specific installation mostly with graffiti artists and street artists. And um, he just thought like, well, we might as well do that in Salt Lake. So. Uh, initially, they invited 40 artists that I was invited, and I just brought Nick along with me. And um, you can play the clip. I don't know if the audio is working. Your laptop, huh? We might have to okay, yeah. save for it. Okay, here we're talking. It's really cute. She's telling me to move something. <laughs> All right. This is an interview. Look how cute we are. She said we met in high school. All right. So this is her talking about our creative practice, which is what? How does it work? Uh, well, for this, I, it was an office building. And we went in there. And at first, I just wanted to know like, what was underneath the carpet. If there was wood, like it looked like it might have been a house at some point in time. So first we started kind of like demolishing the room. Um, and there was hardwood. So I thought like, well, let's stain this. I grew up in a very old house. It was over 100 years old. And we were constantly uh, like refinishing it, working on it. Um, I, since it was an old house, we also had like a lot of antiques and uh, our my parents uh, collected like photos of our super old ancestors 
So we used a bunch of those um, ancestral photos and worked them into like collage and kind of made like your uh, very weird and slightly uh, uh, like upsetting grandma's living room. <laughs> there was a lot of other cool um, pieces. There were people that like tore the roof off and then planted plants up in the attic. There were rooms that were submerged in water. You had to walk on um, stepping stones. It ended up being a way bigger deal than anybody thought it was going to be. And by the end, they kept inviting new artists to fill every tiny little space. And there were over 100 artists on it. And it um, was so fulfilling for us because you'd just go to work in there like on some Thursday night or something. And there would be other people in there. And we um, all end up talking to each other. We ended up making some of like our very best lifelong friends. and the community in Salt Lake uh, grew like a huge amount because of this, because then all of a sudden all the artists knew each other and we all wanted to support each other's work. Um, so like the more artists can get to know each other, I think the better, uh, like we all kind of help each other out with opportunities. So that was a really cool project that we did. And the other part that we missed in terms of quotes is our basic practice is Erin creates something beautiful and then I scribble over the top of it and then she tries to fix the thing that I've ruined and then I ruin the things that she's fixed. So that's like the back and forth. Yeah? I, I can't do what Nick does. Like you can tell him like uh, draw like a crazy monster and I'll just be like what? Like I can't do that. I have to look at something. And so when I first saw Nick drawing things just like creatively, just out of his head, it like blew me away because that's not how I'm trained. That's not how I work. And so it is funny though, like if you sat us both down in front of a still life, his would look really bad. <laughs> but I love his work so much. And there, I've always felt like there's something kind of missing in mine because everyone does portraits, they can get kind of boring. And so, uh, it was also just a way to like make me look better. Yeah. So the the lesson is find a collaborator and marry them. <laughs> that's the that's the basis of our talk. Okay. So um, we we did a lot of screen prints. They uh, talked about that in our introduction. Uh, this is a picture of us uh, doing screen prints and laughing for some reason. Um, I'm going to go through a, a couple of our prints here. We did this for about a decade, um, doing prints for shows. Um, and uh, just to break down our process a little bit. Um, uh, often one or the other of us would take the lead on creating an image uh, um, and uh, be, we did a lot of cartoony images, you can keep going here um, and, and you can tell maybe by the bands, if you're familiar with these bands, it was a very specific era back in the aughts uh, indie rock stuff going on. Um, but often uh, we would switch off, so the person that, who, who created the illustrations, you have to separate uh, the prints into a few layers and we did this in an analog form. We had plastic sheets that we draw on top of. Um, and Aaron often would take my drawings and separate them into different colors. Like um, like not use, not Photoshop, like not separating them with anything. She's just like using her brain. <laughs> That's what you use, right? When you're like <laughs> operating in the world. Um, so she would, she would separate them and, and, and pick colors and stuff like that. And there's a few here that we can go through. Um, the, so a lot of these have some of uh, my illustrations, her color separations, next one. This is one where Erin, uh, you can see she uh, more design elements and, and she was on the forefront here. Um, but uh, this was also, <coughs> collaboration is not easy. And early in our relationship, our collaborative relationship, uh, maybe some of our biggest arguments, like just like all out like yelling and fighting was over colors on a poster like absolutely not an exaggeration like you like purple for this i'm let's get a divorce like, just, <laughs> this should be green there are more death threats than divorce threats probably but, um but it's hard right especially once you uh, become comfortable with uh, a collaborator uh, you come up from it uh, at it with um, different perspectives or direction and so coming to uh understand and be vulnerable and to let things go I think is important, right? Like in those collaborations to let, uh, to trust your collaborator, to let something go and to have confidence in them um, was something that we both had to learn, I think, in the collaborative process. And it, it worked itself out a lot here. There's a couple of prints that actually we did uh, even while we we're in Colombia for some films uh, at Ragtag. 
Um, but we uh, mostly have, have not been doing uh, mini prints. We've been transitioning a little bit, which we'll talk about um, coming up. So here's a for Love and Mercy poster. Uh, I did the Beach Boys, and, and she did all the um, fancy illustrations of Brian Wilson's mind. Um, another part of this too is uh, just sharing our work and uh, a lot of lo local arts festivals and poster festivals is such an important and great thing to do. Um, regardless of the kind of work that you make, this has been something that has also helped us establish friendships and contacts throughout um, the, the nation essentially when we, we go to, to those festivals. It gives you something to work towards which I think is really, really important, finding goals, um, uh, investing in a specific moment and creating work for that moment. Um, we've done that a lot and we've ended up um, meeting um, and enjoying a lot of uh, friendships in those moments. Yeah. This is you. Oh. Um, I guess these slides are just in there to kind of show you that we don't like to hang our pictures in a straight line. <laughs> so you can go past that. <laughs> you can keep going. Um, so I'm just going to kind of talk about some of the communities that we have been able to uh, like become a part of. There used to be a thing called the American Poster Institute, and if you were a certain level of poster maker for uh, shows, then you could join. Um, and then they had, well, they still have uh, flat stocks, which are like poster conventions that go along with uh, music conventions. So like Bonnaroo. Pitchfork, you can stop on this one for a second. And I can't remember the other ones, but one in Germany and stuff. So we would go and uh, just like hang out with a hundred other people that made posters. And we'd end up trading. We have like a giant stack in our house of like just every band. And because we would just, you know, you're like, hey, yeah, I like that. Over. Hey, we, I like that. Room for Swap that. me. We'll give them to you. So a lot of those, even sometimes you don't if you're not making money at them, which sometimes happens, can be uh, fulfilling for contacts. Um, this was at a gallery in Salt Lake. This was a window installation that I did. Um, so installation work is interesting because you cannot sell it. Nobody like wants to buy that and put that in their window. It's just like a weird piece that's super fun. Um, so a lot of these would come out of my pocket and the uh, but whatever the biggest problem was that like how do you show an installation piece like you're not just gonna stick it in your house a gallery can't sell it so they're not like super excited to show you um, it kind of depends on the gallery and you can find a lot of people who are actually really excited about this stuff um, but it does all go in the garbage afterwards so it's like a huge um, marathon to get a giant piece done and then and then it all goes in the garbage afterwards but it's some of the most fulfilling stuff uh, for me you can go to the next one it's just installation you can go to the next one this was a uh, that picture is terrible um, we didn't talk about our broken camera and oh yeah drive. so like there was a picture in there that was like all messed up in 337 project because like <laughs> we are terrible at documenting the stuff we've done so a lot of like my favorite pieces we've ever done that are now in the garbage I have no documentation of ever having done it and so like when we were first given the uh, topic of invest I was like invest in a good camera <laughs> and, and an extra hard drive and back yes. it up like we lost a hard drive full of, uh, of uh, stuff so and we so lost like seven that's years that's like a great and important thing not just for like uh, the sake of like financial means but like for your own purposes right that it's so important to maintain and carry that stuff especially you know, economically and digitally uh, with your work. So uh, a, a reminder that you receive all the time, but we'll receive one more time from us. Like, that's important. So things that are pixelated, I'm like pulling from news articles and like other sources because we lost all the photos. So the uh, last one was in the Salt Lake City Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, it looked better in the dark in real life when the TVs were all, were all on. This was also in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Salt Lake. Um, and this was an 18 hole mini golf course. Um, so it's also in line with um, installation work. They actually gave 
uh, each artist, so there were 18 artists, um, each did a whole, and they gave us like a stipend so that we were able to create this playable golf course. And then when people came to the museum, they actually got to like play a whole round of golf. It was super cool, super fun, very interactive. This is like where art is like my very favorite. Like when the community's involved, when it's like fun for everyone, like kids were way into it. The mayor came and like did the first golf. It was lame. Because we were just like, get all the cute little kids in here. Did the first golf. Um, this was... <laughs> golfers. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I don't know these things. This was um, like a... Ours was kind of like all in its own dark little room. It had like creepy noises and cedar smell. And you had to putt into a little kind of like creepy outhouse that had a monster tree. And you putt between the roots. And that would depend on kind of like where your ball would land. Um, so that was fun when you can go there. Um, also, part of I think we have like a, like five minutes. I'm just trying to okay. So a part of our collaborative process is very chaotic, which is also part of this collaboration. So we're figuring it out as we go as well. Um, yeah. So for like communities, <laughs> uh, we were I'm also we also stuck this in there to just say like support other people's projects. This was a person who started making like little documentaries about artists and then a local magazine started carrying them. And um, a lot of this is not compensated and I have major social anxiety, so it's difficult for me. But saying yes is important. Unless somebody's trying to do, make you do free work and you all know that. Okay. Um, so like we'd have these screen printing parties, bring your own shirt, pick one of those designs on the wall and we'll print it while you're there. Um, and then it's just like a big party on a gallery opening night. I also curated for a record store for quite a while. Their walls were blank. I just walked in and said, you're right by a bunch of really great art galleries. They were sandwiched. Um, like, let's get you involved in uh, the gallery stroll nights. And um, it was a very important for me to help like up and coming artists, students, and also have a price point where like people in that bracket, like maybe in their early 20s, can also buy original work. So that was that. We did a beer, a beer. <laughs> for... We're good at beer too. <laughs> um, this is in one to one uh, print shop here. If you guys know them, they oh, just wow. had a blank wall and uh, they let us paint on it. Um, also, we've tried to support like Ragtag. Um, this is Yellow Dog Bookshop. I did the windows there for a very long time. Um, this was a birthday window, band books window. Um, this one, the owner, Kelsey, just painted a bunch of things yellow and then handed them to me. Uh, this one's way too dark, but it's for a true false window. Um, this was a collaboration with my son's elementary school. Each kid in the whole school made a flower, and then I used those to make the window. Um, and uh, a part of our practice, too, has shifted a little bit. I think maybe the last thing that we want to talk about and that is potentially important is uh, we've had a very strong um, working and collaborative um, exchange that shifted uh, a lot as we moved um, to a new place, uh, as we had children um, and other kinds of developments. And I think it's important to think about and understand in points of collaboration um, how to maintain a, a, a good balance, right, with your, uh, with your family, but also with your collaborator. Um, if we go to the next slide here, as we were making art a lot, we started to collaborate with our kids. Um, so uh, using the same process, allowing uh, the boys, I guess, in the family to destroy the, the girls' art. I don't know, if that's a bad metaphor. It is, that's uh, terrible. Let's go to the next one, keep going. Um, uh, I was drawing a lot of comics, and so uh, my son, uh, when he was four years old, he would draw a, a piece, and we started collaborating. I turned like this uh, drawing into a character that slipped on a banana. Next slide. Um, he, I created panels, he'd scribble in them, and I'd just write like a moose, a man with an axe, <laughs> 10 baby ghosts, and America. <laughs> that was our best one. And then uh, I think this is kind of fascinating drawing and making work with your kids. Your kids seeing you be creative um, inspired them to be creative. At age four, 
um, my son made his first comic um, all by himself. Before he could read and write, right? Before he had any of those language skills, he could create images that communicated something, right? Um, I teach him comics, so like I'm pretty passionate about this. But this is a, a comic about a monster standing over a, a kid's bed, right? Right here. The monster tries to scare him and to wake him up. You see the big cross, it's the big hand in the air. And then in the third panel, he says the, the two stand together to see how big they are, right? So they're sizing each other up. And now in the last panel, they're playing, going from over there, which is kind of like a cute little thing. Um, but uh, as we shifted and changed, uh, we moved uh, because of uh, my schooling and, and uh, my job opportunities. There became a pretty big imbalance in uh, the creative work that we were doing. We were separating a little bit, and I was creating, uh, doing a lot of writing, which is less collaborative. Um, and I think just this to to end, Aaron is going to talk a little bit about how we rebalance that and got back to creating work. Together. Sure. So <laughs> I, no, th this important. part's hard for me to talk about, so hopefully I can even get through it. I'm just going to talk about like the struggle of creativity, and particularly as your life changes and moves around. I've never just been an artist. I'm an accountant, which like I failed math three times. I just work for my dad's company, and I'm terrible at it. <laughs> but like, you have to pay the bills. Um, particularly while Nick was doing school, we both finished our bachelor's and then he decided to get a master's. Uh, we moved to Rhode Island. And I thought, oh, like my art career is great in Salt Lake and it'll just continue. And when we moved to Rhode Island, we were only there two years, which is not long enough to make contacts with people. Um, they also had a, very, a smaller scene than Salt Lake City with regards to arts, because everything would just go up to Boston. Um, and I started realizing that I was like super jealous of Nick because he was still like making goals and doing great things. And I was like doing accounting and like hanging out with our kids, which is great, but not for, not not for me. It's not my thing. Um, I love my kids, but I'm not like, I've always been like, no, I'm like too much of a feminist to like just hang out with my kids. To like day. kids. <laughs> Too much of a feminist to like kids. But really, I'm just kind of too grumpy. Um, so uh, anyway, after Rhode Island, we moved here, um, which I'd never heard of Columbia, Missouri until we lived here and had a really difficult time adjusting to the small uh, townness of it, I guess. Um, and uh, I felt like I had a lack of opportunities all while Nick was still getting like accolades and being published all the time. Um, so this was a struggle for us, a huge struggle for us. Um, I also started getting really sick, found out that I had some chronic illnesses that I'm dealing with and I was bedridden pretty much 90% of every day for about three years. Um, I had like no desire to do art um, and it was very difficult. Um, my mother also died during that time and Trump got elected both in the same year. That was a bad year. <laughs> 2016 was the worst. Um, and then uh, my family's dysfunctional. So it's just been a struggle the whole time. Um, our extended family, our family's functional. <laughs> we're, good, we're fine. <laughs> Unless we're making posters. Um, Which we stopped doing. We stopped printing posters. Uh, my carpal tunnel got really bad. I couldn't pull them anymore. Nick was like in the middle of his PhD. Uh, like, we have no time for this. Um, also, the poster community sort of died, which is very sad. The American Poster Institute uh, and gig posters no longer exist. Um, so anyway, it took us living here for seven years for me to finally uh, say okay to having an art show um, and it took a lot out of me to like get myself to do it because I've lost a lot of confidence um, we finally had a show at resident arts uh, in September mm -hmm. which Nick will talk about for a second um, and after that show I realized that it was like the most I had felt alive in years um, it, it sometimes feels like it's the thing on the back burner if it's not the main source of income for you. Um, 
but your creativity and the things that you're drawn to and are passionate about are so important. And I always hated the term self-care because I thought it sounded very selfish. Um, but I think self-care for an artist, for a cre creative person, is just finding the time, um, finding people that you can go see art with, experiencing art. Um, this is like how we stay alive. So I'll let Nick just finish up by talking about kind of our recent work. Sure. Uh, we'll click through um, these until we start to just get to solo images. I'm going to mostly uh, defer to you all for questions because we want a question and answer period. But I think that this is uh, the, the things that Aaron were saying were a, a big part, uh, important part of thinking about collaboration, thinking about investment. And a part of that means investing in and seeing those people around you, whether they're your spouse or your friends or your coworkers and trying to support them in the best way that you can. And sometimes that means for you to step back out of uh, uh, what you see as uh, your uh, success or, or your work and trying to make space to make work for them, to help them create that work. It is always going to be reciprocal, right? If you are creating communities and you are trying to make space for other people to create work, it's going to come back to you as well. Um, and it is so important to make that space for other people, to create um, communities of artists, to create communities um, uh, like the ones we've been so fortunate to experience uh, in uh, our, uh, that we've discussed here. Um, those opportunities really breed um, happiness and, and life into a community, in yourself, in your groups of friends, and that's, I think, an important part for us. So these are uh, the most recent work that we've started to do. We've started to transition now um, uh, you'll see Aaron's uh, work here with uh, the portraitures, and we'll just go kind of click through these a little bit. These are um, artists um, and um, composers that we were creating work around, um, kind of um, abstract uh, and sometimes dissonant composers, which uh, gave me the right to do the scribble stuff, Aaron says. <laughs> um, and in addition, once you get past this, I, I was creating a lot of comics, so she uh, had work that she was doing creating portraiture. You'll remember that was. Um, uh, something that she's interested in. I'm creating a lot of comics, and so I, I folded her into some of my work. If we click past through um, here, so we're creating some abstract comics as well. These were called static gifts for, for broken musicians, um, and, and kind of a similar theme where we're using a grid to create that work. But finding ways to uh, both approach from our different perspectives and make space for each other to create the work that we want to, to enjoy that work. And it was really, I think, um, a, a maybe the best thing that we've done in the last uh, seven years, which was to put ourselves out there, to find something and commit to it, to create that work even in the face of um, a lot of difficulty um, making the work and, and being able to see others' reactions to it, to interact with them was um, a really wonderful thing. Um, so that's us, that's our uh, ideas about investment, if you can make the connections. I, I don't have a clock. I think we're probably out of time. Yeah.